Um, hello, everybody. This is John Ross. Uh, we're uh, about ready to start here. Um, we're, we have a few people still calling in uh, because uh, we've had some technical difficulties here. So uh, uh, we'll start here shortly. Hello, uh, this is John Ross, and uh, today is uh, uh, we're we're doing uh, a webinar, an IKD training webinar, and um, basically just want to run through a few things uh, to start with here. Um, uh, basic. Uh, as I said, my name is John Ross, and I've got over 30 years of experience uh, working on rotary equipment like kilns, dryers, and ball mills, uh, basically in uh, various types of industry that we have in uh, out there that do uh, use this type of equipment. Um, my background is I've worked uh, uh, in uh, various things from being an alignment specialist uh, to uh, running projects, uh, managing field crews. I'm an OEM certified uh, kiln and dryer maintenance instructor. Um, this, is, this is our first uh, live session. So uh, be play, please be patient with us and tell us how we did. We'll, we'll be sending you a survey on, uh, on um, uh, just comments that you can give us that will help us improve what we're doing uh, with the webinar. Uh, now, if you do have any technical difficulties during this session, for whatever reason, uh, uh, the, the number right here on the screen, 877-316-6140, uh, if you call in there and mention that you're trying to get on the webinar, uh, we'll have some people there to help you. OK, we're going to encourage questions. And we're going to have three, uh, three different breaks in the webinar where questions can be answered. But we're, we have quite a few people on this uh, the webinar here today. So rather than doing it by voice, um, well, there's a down, down at the bottom of your screen there, you'll see uh, questions. And if you hit on that question uh, uh, comment thing and then just type in your questions, we'll take questions for, from you in the in the order that they're uh, given during these uh, question breaks, and just to let you know, this session will be recorded, uh, and we will send all of you who attend the uh, the webinar here today a link with that recording in the event that uh, some of your other people would like to listen in on it. Okay, uh, starting out. Uh, here, basically, what I wanted to do today, the, the topic that we're going to be talking on is uh, troubleshooting and inspections of the, of the various equipments. Um, and 
one of the reasons why we wanted to start with this particular topic is that we we're seeing a lot of change that's happening in the industry with the uh, with the retirement of the baby boomers that are happening. Uh, we have a lot of people, uh, a lot of maintenance departments out there that are have new people or the people that have retired have not been replaced. So we see a lot of maintenance departments that are understaffed uh, and, and the staff that they do have are uh, inexperienced. So one of the things that uh, IKD uh, has started is, is to try to fill the void for a lot of the inexperience out there and the lack of the personnel that uh, for years and years took care of the equipment out there. We're trying to supplement the industry with uh, the training that we have uh, developed over the years. Um, so most maintenance departments that we find nowadays are, are in a situation where, where years ago they had a large staff and were able to really work with preventative maintenance. But in recent years, we've seen a situation where maintenance departments have basically become more like fire departments. They're essentially working with breakdown maintenance and don't have a lot of personnel available to do uh, preventative type maintenance programs. So this is kind of what we're addressing with the troubleshooting and uh, the inspections that would, because of this situation, it becomes more and more important to understand what our equipment is doing out there and try to establish some trends and some early warning uh, signals of uh, when uh, equipment is having some maintenance issues. So one of the first things that we need to do as a maintenance department is to come up with some kind of a, of a form. So on this screen here, you can see that it is uh, an inspection type form that you want to use. Um, now you can develop one for yourself. This is just this is just kind of one of the inspection forms that we uh, use for our own personnel that when they're out there looking at uh, equipment. And as you, as you can see, it has a variety of different things like creep, clearance, uh, directions of thrust, all kinds of different things, the tire condition, um, and we'll be looking at some of these things. Now, the first thing we want to do is we want to establish some kind of a daily inspection. Uh, and a daily inspection, when, we, when we're looking at doing a daily type inspection, Really what we're interested in is, about, is a, like a five to ten minute walk by inspection where we kind of get a look at the equipment and, uh, and see what's happening on a daily basis. It's important to do this because if you don't have a consistent uh, inspection program going on with your equipment, it's almost nearly impossible to trend anything to see what's happening over an extended period of time. So what we want to do is we want to do a walk-by inspection every day. Okay, one of the first things that I highly recommend in doing any kind of inspection program is that we go into the, uh, the operation uh, uh, control room where, where the unit's being operated on, and we want to check for things like what's the feed rate, what what is the what's the temperature? So we we got an idea of what uh, what the production uh, is running through, and in 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 many cases, uh, plants will run different types of batches through the unit, and they'll have different feed rates from week to week. This is this is something that becomes important in being able to log into your inspection reports because. Each time you're changing a load or a batch in the, on the equipment will make a difference in how that unit uh, is operating. Uh, another important thing that you want to check is you want to check the drive amperages. If you have in your control room uh, what actually the drive uh, uh, amperage is running at, uh, it, it's a good thing to, to look at. 
amperages, uh, for example, if you have any kind of mechanical problems that are going on that, that create, a, create a drag on the equipment, you'll get a sudden spike in amperages. Uh, for example, if you have a bearing that's failing, um, when the bearing starts to fail, it'll heat up, the bearing will start to seize, and it won't roll freely. The, the, roll, the, the support roller won't roll freely. So you can get a situation where, where it starts to, to put a drag on the motor and you'll see an amperage spike. The other thing that you want to look at on a daily basis, and, and you might want to, uh, if you don't have one of the infrared guns that you can actually check temperatures with, I strongly recommend every maintenance department have at least a, a, a few of these type of guns where you can go out there and shoot the temperatures of the bearings. Uh, you can also take a, use it for uh, on your gears and so forth, your gear reducers, anything that you're looking for a temperature spike. This, this is something that uh, is, is important in any time you're going to have a bearing failure or, or something of that nature. One of the first indications of that is that you're going to see a, a spike in the, in the temperature. Um, a, a very quick visual check of tire and uh, riding ring tire or support roller trunnion bases for new wear patterns. Um, if something happens with the adjustment of the rollers or you have a bearing failure or uh, a multiple of, of different things can happen, one of the first indications of that happening is that you're going to see some kind of pattern show up on the surfaces of your tires and rollers and in, sometimes, in some cases on your gears and pinions. The other thing you want to do on a daily inspection is to check for vibration and, and visually inspect the drive gear and pinion. Um, this is very important. Because if you start to bottom in your gear, if your gear starts to bottom in your pinion, first off, you're going to see um, a spike or a, a spike in the vibration or more vibration. Now, this doesn't mean you have to go out and do vibration analysis on a daily basis. But what you do want to do is you want to get out there and maybe touch the, the, the pinion bearings. Uh, feel the you know feel the support frame around the gear just to get a kind of feel of what the vibration is normally running. If you do start bottoming in the, the gear in the pinion, that vibration will increase. So uh, it's important that you do this on a on a consistent basis. Uh, as well as that, you want to you want to visually look at the gear in pinion. Uh, and, and most most uh, units will have some kind of port in the gear guard if you have a gear uh, guard enclosure or even if you have an open gear you want to make sure that you're getting lubrication on the gear. Um, the next thing that you want to do in this daily inspection is to check the uh, axial thrust of the dryer. Is it uh, running on the downhill thrust roller or on the uphill thrust rollers? And then uh, uh, check lubrication on support rollers, thrust rollers, and as, as already mentioned, you want to check the gear lubrication systems. Make sure that they're operating. Um, so this is kind of a daily inspection. Like I said, you don't want to spend a lot of time on this because, as we know, we don't have a lot of time nowadays. So, but you do want to get your eyes on that equipment on a very consistent basis because what we want to start to do with a maintenance program like this is start to start to set up for trends. Okay, on a weekly inspection, we want to check the drive amperage for what it's been over the past several days. So we want to go into the control room. Again, we want to check what's the feed rate, uh, what, what's, what's the speeds, anything that will give us an idea of, uh, of, of what needs to be done. Uh, or what's happening with the equipment. Um, check that over the, the, a period of the week, OK, as it stayed pretty consistent during the week. The other thing that you want to look at probably on a weekly basis, maybe not every week, but at least on a biweekly basis, is uh, check the relative movement of the riding ring or the tire on, on, uh, on units that have floating 
tires, which they're not uh, rigidly attached to the shell through wedges or being welded onto the shell and so forth. If a tire has what we call creep in it, we want to measure that from time to time. So um, this is something you know you want to do kind of on a, a weekly to semi-weekly basis. Uh, it's also important to make make sure that your seals are operating. Um, one of the one of the best ways to reduce costs on a uh, on a dryer kiln or any kind of operating equipment is to be able to seal the dryer kiln properly, so that you're holding the temperature inside the unit and not letting it escape um, through gaps in the seals. So it's important that um, to maintain the seal that we don't we don't have a lot of run out in those shells that would take the seal out. These are these are the type of things you want to keep an eye on on a weekly basis. It's not a bad idea to check the welds on filler bars uh, or support pads, wedges, whatever you use in the mount the tire, and on the retaining block, stop blocks, or the rings that uh, hold the tire on the on on the shell. And uh, at the same time, it's not a bad idea if on a weekly basis to, to kind of check any kind of welding, like the sh shell seams or so forth, uh, especially on units that have a lot of temperature, because the temperature expansion and retraction can cause weld seams to crack. Um, another thing that you can do with an infrared uh, gun on, on a weekly basis is actually check the temperature of the gear and pinion mesh. In the viewport on the gear enclosure, what you want to do is just kind of take that infrared gun and scan it across the face of the pinion gear. Uh, what you would like to see in this particular situation is that the, the temperature across the face of the pinion is fairly uniform. If it is not, so, so for example, you may have 90 degrees on the left side of the pinion and it kind of increases a little bit in the middle because there's more contact through the middle of the of the gear and pinion. Uh, so you may have a hundred and uh, you may you may have a, a 95 to 100 degrees, and then come back down on the right side of the pinion to 90 degrees. If if you're kind of coming in that ballpark where it's a nice even curve and and kind of zeroes out on both sides, you're in good shape. If you get it where it spikes and goes from 90 degrees up to 110 degrees on the right side, your your pinion and gear are not aligned properly, and you're going to have wear issues. So this is a real quick, easy check to be able to make sure that you're uh, maintaining a proper gear mesh and, and alignment of the gear. Also, if you start bottoming in the pinion, what's going to happen is you're going to start increasing the temperatures. So it may, it may have ran 90 degrees uh, on the pinion for weeks, and then down the road, all of a sudden, you're seeing spikes of 100, 110 degrees, and and you're in a situation where you've got some issues with your uh, with your uh, uh, heating up of the pinion. You can also use an infrared gun to check the tire and ro uh, tire riding ring to support roller trunnion contact area. This is a good indication that if you've got a tire, if you've got a roller skewed excessively, you're going to have it where if it's if it's really skewed in hard, you may see a high temperature on one side of the roller versus the other side. So these things are are something that you would like to check on a weekly basis. Here again, this is more for recording purposes, so that down the road. You have a trend of how your how your units are operating over an extended period of time. Mon monthly inspections. Uh, it's a good idea that if you have any kind of opportunity at all to when the when if the and especially if the unit can come down for uh, for a short period of time is is to actually check your your pitch line separation between the drive gear and pinion. Most manufacturers of gears and pinions scribe a pitch line onto the side of the gear or the pinion, and this is something that you want to check from a period on a periodic basis. Um, and then general general inspections would be to check like 
dust filters, intakes on motors, uh, gear reducer oil levels, anything that uh, would uh, potentially shut you down over a period of time. And it's also a good idea to uh, to be able to uh, to check the temperatures on your motors and your gear reducers to see if temperatures have increased over a period of time. Um, most plants out there anymore have their own vibration. If it's a fairly large plant, you're going to have uh, people in the plant that do vibration analysis. Uh, it's a good idea to do it um, on a monthly basis where you have some your vibration people come out and 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 shoot the, the pinion uh, pinion bearings, the gear reducers, um, and uh, any the drive motor, and and you can even use it to check the check the support rollers or trunnion bearings. Um, anything, and the idea behind this all, all is that you, what you want to do is you want to start collecting enough, enough information on this equipment over a period of time so that you can see if there is issues uh, in um, um, that that are starting to show up over a period of time. For example, um, I already mentioned uh, drive motor amperages. If if you're if you're tracking um, your equipment over uh, an extended period of time of several weeks, and you start to see the amperages keep increasing, it, but it increases on a kind of a on a uh, a gradual scale where it goes up by five ten percent over a period of several weeks, it, it may and and if you're in your inspections, you're looking at the unit and it's riding continuously on the downhill thrust roller for example, well, that indication would be, hey, we've, we, we're running hard. We're starting to run really hard on that thrust roller. Um, and if you're taking bearing temperatures of the thrust roller, you'll see some, you'll start to see an increase in temperatures. It's time to go out and make a move on that unit to get the thrust so it's not thrusting continuously on the thrust roller. This, this is the type of trend that you're starting to look for. Also, you, if, you're, if you're taking bearing temperatures over a period of time and you see a gradual increase in the temperature of the bearings on, on either the pinions or the rollers, uh, indication is that you're, you may have too much skew on that roller and you're starting to look at, at uh, a possible bearing failure down the road. Quarterly inspections are basically quarterly inspections are, are uh, what, what I would term it as is it's the same thing as a monthly, you probably notice. But what you want to do is you want to look at your, or at your trends over a three-month period. So now what you're trying to do is, OK, what are our bearing temperatures? What are, what are our wear patterns? What, are our, what is our amperage? Has our feed rate remained the same? Has our speeds? You know, all these things you want to take a look at over an extended period of time. Um, and finally, what we want to get into in, into these checklists is, is uh, an annual inspection. Now, most plants out there that, uh, that I've worked with over the years have at least one shutdown per year. Um, some have gone to more extended ones of 18 months, and some have gone for, uh, for even longer than that. But for the most part, they're, they're there is going to be a planned outage at the plant. If, if you don't have a planned outage, then you're probably working on breakdown maintenance. Whenever something breaks, you go down and you try to rush in uh, and, and, uh, and do whatever repairs and, and corrections that you can make in that, in that time period. It's a, it's a tough way to live um, by doing breakdown maintenance. So if, but if you do have uh, uh, a scheduled outage, these are some of the things you want to look at in an annual inspection. This is a perfect time to do a check on your alignment. So one of the things I would recommend is that you, that you check the elevation and the alignment. What has changed over the last year of operation? Have it, has has the, the drum changed? Are you having any settling on your basis and so forth? Okay, part of that inspection or part of that alignment check would be to check is the drum in the correct position to operate. Um, 
you know, basically when we're talking about alignment of dryers and kilns and mills, we're talking about there's there's a specific position that that unit has to sit in for it to operate correctly, and and uh, and there, we call it a triangle, and the triangle is it's the rollers and tires form a triangle together, and to set the thing at the correct elevation, so from pier to pier it's going to be on the design slope. You have to check that from time to time. Um, as well as that, you want to check um, how, how you have your support rollers thrusted or your trunnions thrusted. Does the skew, is the skew consistent with each other? Are you distributing the load between uh, all of the rollers? Or do you have some rollers pushing the kiln in one direction? Or do you have them pushing in the other? These are things that if you just did that alone and made sure that you're keeping your skew uniform on all your rollers, it would be you'd be amazed at how well the unit will operate, and at, at a reduced cost of uh, of uh, of the electrical output of the motor. So these are important things that you want to look at on a on a on a on a scheduled basis. Uh, when the when the unit's down and you have it, and, and for for this type of outage, anything that you can check, like the flange bolts on the gear. Are, are your are your bolts tight? Have they come loose? Have they broken off? These are inspections you want to make. Are your splice bolts uh, uh, intact? Are they broken? Um, are they holding the gear together? Typically, your gear is, your, is the most expensive component on your unit, so you want to make sure that those things are are checked on a periodic basis. Um, if you had the if you had the time and the ability, it's not a bad idea to check uh, the radial alignment of your gear. This can be done rather easily just by checking root clearance on the gear in four spots around the shelf. So you, if if you're working in quadrants, you can actually see how much runout you have in the gear by by checking your root clearance between the gear and pinion. Um, dry check alignment. There again, that depends on what you're doing during your shutdown, but uh, uh, it's it's a good idea to uh, to look at um, the drive alignment from time to time. Definitely, what you want to do on an annual basis is in, is in at least four spots or four quadrants around the gear is is to check the. The, the condition of the gear teeth. So clean up the, the gear teeth on the pinion and on the gear and, and look and see what kind of wear patterns you're developing. Now, do you have any type of pitting? Uh, do you have uh, scuffing or abrasive type wears? Does it look like your pinion or your gear is starting to get in the bottom of the pinion? This is a perfect opportunity to do this type of inspection so that you can make any moves if you need to to, to correct the 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 position of the gear and the pinion. Um, at the same time, go through all your structural steel bases. Just kind of take a look at them. Uh, uh, make sure you don't have any cracks, uh, especially on smaller equipment dryers that turn at a higher RPM. There's there there is the type of uh, wear conditions, and if you've had vibration over the past where that vibration uh, can start to twist the basis and you'll get cracks and so forth. Um, and that's the other thing why you want, especially on dryers, why you want to check uh, 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 structural, uh, structural steel bases, the alignment and elevation of them. Um, so ba uh, gear guards, uh, check to make sure that you don't have too much buildup in your gear guards. On open gearing, uh, it's not a bad idea to clean out all the pits. Uh, uh, I've seen uh, numerous cases where the pinions running in in the, in the grease or the gear lubricant. It's mixed with dust and dirt, and you're actually forming a lapping compound. So during during your outage, clean up the pits. Make sure the pinions running freely without in, in without being in any kind of product and and contaminated uh, oils and grease. Uh, you know, on uh, on support rollers and thrust mechanisms, it's a good time. This is a good time to kind of 
open up the, the support rollers and take a look, especially on kilns, take a look on the inside, see what you've got going on there. Do you have any signs of wear, different things like that. And on, on kilns, it's, it's uh, uh, on the bottom part there, it's, uh, it says ultrasound or shear wave, the, the roller shafts on kilns. This is very important on multi-peered uh, kilns where there's more than two peers. If they have three to four or even more peers and, and tires on this kiln, it's very important to uh, uh, inspect those roller shafts from, uh, from a period of time because you can get bending of the shafts and, and breakage of roller shafts over on, on equipment that's 20, 20 plus years in the field. Okay, is there any questions on uh, on this section of it? Okay. All right, I'm I'm getting to my screen here to look at the questions. All right, I am in the middle of a maintenance outage. Uh, and I will be in and out of my office, okay. Cecil got that. Um, on the next question, uh, support rollers, I understand, are case hardened. What is the reasonable thickness where before uh, replacing a, 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 a support roller? Okay, Joshua. Uh, most rollers, are actually not case hardened. Um, uh, um, case hardening was type of a, of a, a hardening that uh, was used on, uh, especially on drier equipment for a number of years. But most manufacturers have uh, have got away from that type of uh, hardness. If they are case hardened, typically what you're looking at is about a um, is, is about an eighth inch of hardness. And this is what creates a problem and why most manufacturers have gone away from it, is that that basically you'll get through that eighth inch and then you get a very soft material and it'll just start peeling metal. So as soon as you start to get through that eighth inch of material, you should get those rollers out of there. And uh, if it, on a recommended, the same, uh, Joshua, the same thing is uh, on a recommended hardest on support rollers on the riding ring, you're, you're typically you make your rollers a little bit harder. Um, and that'll vary depending on what type of, if you're doing a through, harden, a through hardness, typically a 250 Brunel, uh, somewhere in that range. And uh, if it's case hardened, they, I've seen them up as far, higher, far as uh, 400 Brunel, and and the problem with that is they're very brittle and will break out over a period of time. Okay. Um, uh, yes, Bill Clark, uh, w uh, your question was uh, you mentioned that there'd be a recording made, and we'll have access to it. Uh, is there a link that we can do PowerPoint slides to you? Typically, in the in the seminars that I, I do around the country, we will provide the slides as well. So, if you if you got if anybody is interested in those uh, of the slides of this PowerPoint presentation, let us know and we will get them to you. Um, Tim Thomas, uh, hi Tim. Um, yeah, recommended creep, and he's 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 uh, Tim is asking question. What is acceptable creep on a riding ring? And basically, what you want to do is the rule of thumb is kind of like around. You want to keep it under an inch, and the reason why, um, the reason why you would you why you want to do that is because, um, um. The more that creeps, the more that tire creeps, the more wear it's going to have on the retainers, on the support pads, and so forth. So it'll accelerate the wear. 
and and then also on, on kilns, the more creep you have, the more ovality you're also going to have on the on the on the kiln shell, which if it's refractory line, can be detrimental to the operation. Um, next question by Joshua: How about the riding ring? Is uh, um, how about the riding ring wear thickness before replacing it? Uh, it there again, that's going to depend on on the on the design of the unit, the loads, and so forth. How how much the weight is supporting? That's that's really going to be kind of an engineering function. All right, I got, I'm going to answer a couple more questions, and then we what we'll do at the end of the seminar or at the end of this PowerPoint is we'll 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 go through all the questions, whoever wants to stay on the line and, and, and go through them. But for now, I think we need to get back to the webinar to keep it within the time frame that we want to do. So we'll answer some more questions uh, at the end of the, of the webinar or in the next section. OK, the next section we want to go into is wear patterns on the tires and rollers. Um, there's there's a number of different types of wear patterns that will show up that are, are are a great indication of different mechanical things that are going on in in uh, the uh, in the daily operation of the units. Um, the most common type of wear pattern that you're probably going to see out there is concave and convex wear patterns. Now we're going to go through some pictures and some slides that explain each one of these patterns. So. I'm just going to run through this list real quick. It's the other one uh, is conical or radi radial taper wear patterns, uneven wear on surfaces, falling and pitting on wear, and various other types of uh, wear patterns. Okay, so the most the most common type of wear pattern that you're probably going to see out there is what we call concave wear on your rollers. And concave wear is where it's high on the edges now. Um, this is kind of a, a fairly significant amount of concave where hopefully you guys don't have that type of wear at your plant. And if you do, you can give us a call. We'll help you out. But uh, uh, for the most part, this is pretty this is pretty radical type wear. Um, concave and con convex wear is basically where the tire here will wear kind of in a crowned or convex pattern. And, and the roller will wear in a concave, or what we call a dished out type of wear pattern. Now, concave and convex wear is, is common just by the very nature of this unit having to put skew on the rollers to control the thrust of the unit. Um, the higher the speed, uh, the more slope is on the unit is going to require more and more adjustment of the, of the of the support rollers or trunnions. So in this diagram, what you're seeing is okay. Uh, for this particular unit, you have to put 15 thousandths of thrust or or skew on this roller in order to uh, to maintain the unit from thrusting too hard on the downhill thrust roller. Okay, so if you came in with, and and the best practice on this is to have these shafts of the of the support rollers always parallel to each other. So if this one is skewed in fifteen thousandths on this side, this one should be skewed in fifteen thousandths on this side. Now this is kind of exaggerated a little bit, but what you see when you do that type of adjustment on these rollers is you're actually putting a much greater pressure on the edges of the tires. So if you skew in hard on this side, you're going to put more wear on this edge. And on this roller, you're going to put more wear on this edge. So just by the intrinsic nature of this equipment, you're creating wear of a concave and convex nature on, on the unit. So that's why it's more common. This is also why it's more, more. It's very important that you want to distribute the the thrust of all the rollers evenly. This way, you won't get one pier where you're where you're trying to control the complete thrust of the unit using one roller or two rollers on one pier, 
and you're over skewing those rollers to compensate for not adjusting the other rollers. Another type of wear that, you're, that you see out there that's a little less obvious to see from a visual inspection is what we call taper or conical type wear. That's the type of wear where you, you have a high edge on one side and then it kind of it kind of comes down so that your diameter of this roller is larger on this side than it is on this side. And, and that's a wear pattern that's, that's it's pretty common out there. Um, the problem with this wear pattern is, is, is it actually forms a taper lock on the, between the tire and the rollers so that it's going to make this, uh, this, this tire, it's going to be very difficult for the unit to thrust in this direction. So if this is the uphill side, um, you're, it's, it's going to be hard for this unit to go in the downhill direction because it's locked in with this, this roller being tapered like that. One of the most common things that you'll see when you have tapered uh, tires and rollers is a big gap on the side of these retainers. So in this particular picture here, you can see that this, this is probably uh, an inch and a half, two inches gap. If you went over here and measured these retainings or stops on this, this side of the unit, it's probably half the size. Of, the, of these retainers because it's wore into or wore those stops away and, and has probably worn into the tire. Uh, this is very in a very undesirable situation when you get this type of wear. Okay, one of the things that there's a, there's there's three or, there's a few reasons that cause tapered wear. Probably the most common reason for tapered wear is that you have skewed your rollers incorrectly so that this roller is pushing on this side or thrusting in this roller is thrusting in now a lot of uh, I've seen a lot of plants use this technique to try to control things especially if they have a tire that is thrusting excessively the problem with it is is that by doing this, you're actually thrusting the tire in one direction on one roller and in the other direction in the other roller. So you have, you're going to have a real erratic thrust situation uh, on how the unit is uh, running on thrust rollers. And in top of that, once you get that type of wear going on, uh, that this tapered type wear or conical wear, it's, it's nearly impossible to deal with uh, the adjustments and so forth if it gets extensive enough. All right, this diagram is a diagram of, of how you should adjust rollers. Okay, in some cases, uh, you, uh, manufacturers have designed equipment so that um, the, the thrust roller will take the full load of, of the unit. Um, and so it would be possible in that case where these, these rollers could actually be as very close to neutral without any skew on them. But I would say that's, a, that's kind of a rare situation where we, we have thrust rollers that um, take the full load. And even if they are designed initially to take the full load, if you get any kind of shell damage that causes run out in the tires and rollers, you're going to have, you're going to have issues with that. The, the best way to adjust your rollers is with a slight skew where they're even. The roller shafts on both sides are basically in the same plane. And the adjacent pier, if you have a two pier unit, they're skewed with the same amount of thrust from the center of the drum. If you can do that and distribute between all four rollers or on multiple pier kilns, um, all, the, all the rollers, if you do that evenly all the way through, that's going to be the best position to run your, run your units in. Without question, the last thing you want to do out there is to get a situation where you have the rollers that are not parallel to each other. There's a lot of different things that are going to cause problem, tapered wear being one of them. Okay. Now, this is basically for most kiln users. If, you, if you're getting any kind of hot bearings or, or, or uh, 
issues with bearings, uh, it's usually a situation where one of these uh, conditions of, of either alignment of the unit, alignment of the structural bases, or the adjustment has caused excessive uh, um, misalignment and, and, uh, and temperatures will increase as a result of that. Another type of wear that you're going to see out there from time to time is an uneven wear. So you're, you're seeing bands of wear around uh, the tires and rollers. And this is typically, in most cases that I've been around, is, is a, is a situa situation where it's, it's a, a contamination issue. For example, I see a lot of times where this, this roller will be running in product. The product has grease mixed in with it, metal flakes, uh, all kinds of different abrasive materials. And as the roller runs into it, it picks it up and it actually starts to wear into the surfaces with an uneven wear pattern. And this is another example of an uneven wear pattern where you're not getting full contact across the face of the tire. Okay, one, one, one type of wear that comes up every once in a while, and it's not very common, but you can see it from time to time, is what we call diagonal wear patterns on the faces of the tires and rollers. If you're walking by on, on your inspection, your daily inspection, and you see these diagonal marks, what it is, it's an indication that something has changed with the, with the rollers uh, and, and how they're thrusting or how they're adjusted to the extent that it's starting to peel, peel metal. And this is probably the type of, uh, of uh, what you'll see out there. And it may not be all the way across the face of the tire. But if you see this, this band of diagonal marks that you, that you have like this in, in this type of situation, it's an indication that this roller has been miscued. For example, if they really push in hard on one roller, not on the other roller, or if you pigeon toe the rollers like we showed in that diagram where the shafts are not parallel to each other, the shafts of the rollers, excuse me, um, then basically uh, you'll get this type of thing. And it's, and it's usually in an uh, excessive, uh, excessive adjustment thing. But if you see that type of wear right away, you're going to know that you've got a roller, that's, uh, at least one roller that's misadjusted. The thing that you want to check is if you see that, you, you should go to the control room right away because uh, what you'll see is you, you'll probably also see a very uh, uh, a sharp spike in the, uh, the, the motor amperages in the control room. And that would be an indication that you need to get out there and make some adjustments. Uh, another common type of wear pattern is if you see horizontal lines across the surface of the tire or roller. Um, we, uh, you know, I, we call these timing marks. And typically what you'll see is if, if you look at the, the spacing of these marks, and sometimes they'll show up as very faint uh, lines across the tire and rollers. They, they'll show up initially as faint marks. So I, I've seen them as deep as an eighth inch, and, and the unit is bouncing all over the place. But, but typically, when you're first looking at this stuff, if you see these faint horizontal marks, and they're about the space, about the size of the tooth thickness on the gear, you're looking at the, the most probable cause is that the gear is starting to bottom in the pinion. And it's starting to vibrate. So you're getting enough of a, of a transfer of that vibration from the gear that it's uh, transferring into the tires and rollers. Other types of flat spots that are wider in nature are typically uh, a result of, of some kind of uh, issue with the, with the rollers. For example, a bearing failed, um, and, and it, the roller seized up, and you wore a flat spot in the tire. Well, once, the, once you change off the roller and stuff, um, it starts rotating, and that flat, stop, flat spot remained in the tire transferred to the other rollers. And now you've got these flat spots that are transferring all the way around the unit. Um, other other times I've seen uh, situations where 
uh, especially on uh, larger equipment where, where you start the unit up and for whatever reason the, the oil or the lubrication in the bearings of the support rollers haven't didn't really take hold and and you, you start it up and the roller stays still and the unit turns and you get a flat spot that way. So you see there's really wide flat spots. And this is a photo of some real severe cases of uh, of uh, flat spots in in uh, in a tire and and the vibration on this type of uh, of a situation would be quite uh, extreme. In fact, you would probably wouldn't want to stand next to that unit too much. So um, you don't want to let it get this far. Um, Anyway, other types of wear are circumferential grooves. Uh, this this particular photo has about it all. Um, it's spalling, pitting, circumferential grooves. This is, obviously this is running in some uh, has contamination issues, so forth. Um, if you start to see a lot of lines and grooves on your support roller, I mean on your thrust rollers and your Thrust tire. Uh, obviously, you're probably thrusting too hard on that uh, on that unit, and you need to relieve the load on it. You don't want to get to the point where you're starting to lose material on this thrust roller. What will happen is, as you lose that material, the the unit is actually moving in the direction that you're losing the material, and you can lose contact between your gear and pinion and cause uh, premature failures on that. Uh, if you get these type of wear patterns, about the only thing you can do is is uh, is um, grind them out, um, and that's that's one of the things that you want to avoid. Anytime you have to grind, you're going to be taking material and life of the, of the component off. So basically, it's uh, you want to try to control what's going on with the unit while you're operating. All right, we're gonna, I'm going to go ahead. Uh, we, I've got a few more slides on gears, and rather than answering questions right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go on to the end of the uh, of the webinar, uh, and and then we'll do all the questions and answers. If you want to stay online, and we'll we'll run through all the questions. Okay, other other type of conditions that you want to look at for inspections is okay. Okay, look at the support pads, the retaining blocks, stop blocks. Uh, these are these are, are areas of maintenance headaches where you get a lot of cracking, wear, different things like that. Keep an eye on that. Keep an eye on your all your weld seams on the shells, especially on kiln hot spots. If you've got hot kiln shell deformation and anything that would indicate that you created a crank or a wobble in the shell as a result of, uh, of losing refractory. Uh, gear design issues. So I just want to run through a few things on gear designs. Uh, on rotary equipment like dryers and kilns, they're unique in nature because they, uh, the tires that sit on the rollers um, are what we call an external type mounting system. You know, more, a lot of things like mills and different things are in a fixed center, and the expansion of the shell for, for because of temperature would create a situation where the gear would grow into the pinion mesh with the expansion. Um, on dryers and kilns, it's the opposite. Actually, because the, the tires expand, the rollers expand, the gears expand. It's the the gear is going to grow out of mesh with the pinion. So it actually, as it expands, it expands externally. The gear grows out of out out of mesh. So this pitch line, uh, when setting a pitch line on a gear, it's okay on a dryer and a kiln to to match the pitch line. Because as this gear grows, it's going to separate that pitch line. Okay, so if you're slightly separated, it's fine. If you're tangent or even with the pitch lines, you're fine. If if you're crossing pitch lines like this, then you're going to have vibrations issues. Issues. So that's something just to note on a gear. 
uh, and pinion for rotary or uh, rotary type equipment like what we're we're talking about here. So in a sense, what you want to do is is you want to have if this being the gear and this is the pinion, you want to have it flush or a little bit of separation. You don't want this down any further. Because as you can see, if you start getting down to where you have this radius in the gear, then you're going to have a bottom effect that happens and you'll get high vibrations. So in, the, in this particular case, um, this, this, pinion, this gear is way into this pinion. You can't hardly even see where there's any clearance at all. This would be a very rough running unit as a result of the, of the way the gear is in the pinion. Now, one of the things that happens over a period of time, if you have, if you've run, if your unit is is quite a few years old, is you'll get what we call a false bottom. See, originally this thing was where the the pinion was right here with this tooth, but I because over the years as this gear operated, it wore a false bottom in this pinion or in this gear. So in order to run it without vibration issues, you would actually have to separate the, the, the pinion and the gear a little bit from what it normally would have been set at. Uh, and this is another reason why once, uh, once your gears have been worn, uh, you can't set them by backlash. And the only way you can really set the gear to the pinion for uh, being parallel is by using root clearance. Types of gear, uh, wear patterns. This would be kind of a, that what we just showed you. It's kind of a root interference where you've wore away the envelope of the gear, and and now you have a false bottom set up so that you're basically going to have to open up the gear a little bit more, which will increase backlash and and it'll cause some rough operation. This is a this is an example of. Uh, when a gear exceeds load designs uh, for whatever reasons. It's been a popular practice in the past oh, 15, 20 years for, for uh, operations to increase the, the load and throughput and the speed of the units to get more production out of the unit. Well, that comes with a price. And one of the prices can be that it will exceed the design limitations of the gear and pinion, and you will have gear and pinion failure. And uh, but it's very common to see plants out there that are running 50 percent to, uh, to as much as 100, 150 percent more production through a unit than what it was designed for. And if that's the case in your plants, you're going to have issues with gear, tire, and roller wear. Um, scuffing or transfer adhesion. This is this is usually a situation where you, if you have this type of wear pattern, you have insufficient oil film strength to form a rolling contact that is protected. And you, what you're actually getting is the gear and the pinion are um, fusing together or welding together. And then you're pulling metal out on each time it runs through uh, the contact point on that. Um, if you see these vertical lines like this on a gear, you've, you've got you've got contamination in your oil, and and this kind of this kind of situation when you first and this is why it's so important to look at that pinion and gear on a frequent basis uh, because it can happen fast uh, where a gear can deteriorate and you can take off the whole face contact of a gear in a very short period of time. I've seen that happen in several cases in the industry where a brand new gear can be worn out in less than a month. And, and, and it's purely because there wasn't enough oil and, and it, started to, it started to pit. Then you got all the contamination of that metal mixed in the oil and it lapped down the gear in a very short period of time. Um, this is basically, uh, this here is an example of some poor lubrication, that, uh, and that's the type of pitting that you'll see on a gear and pinion if you have uh, inadequate oil film. 
Now you also see on this particular gear where you got a lot of wear and a lot of pitting on one side of the tooth and not so much on the other side. So there's you have two combinations that's probably happened here. You've overloaded this side of the tooth because your 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 pinions misaligned. When you're first starting out with pitting, you'll see real small lines like this here. And if you can catch it at this point, and if you see it on one side of the pinion and gear and not on the other, it's a good indication that you've got a little bit of misalignment. And it would be uh, beneficial to do an alignment check on that gear and pinion to try to get that thing lined up so that you have full contact. The other thing you want to look at is if you see any of this type of wear occurring on the gear and pinion, put that infrared gun on there and see what the temperature difference is. Uh, here again, this uh, in this slide here, you've got uh, poor lubrication, and and really for most gear situations that happen out there, it's it's uh, it's a factor of uh, the gear lubrication is failing for whatever reason. Okay, we're going to go to questions and answers now, and and uh, that's basically the uh, the PowerPoint presentation. If you guys are interested in hearing the questions, we'll go ahead and and I'll, I'll answer all the questions that you guys put out there. So um, um, that's that's the conclusions of the slides. Okay. All right. This is a question by Robert Porbeck. Uh, the information I've seen already is good. Can we get a copy of this presentation or at least get the slides that have lists, checklists, and uh, et cetera on them? Uh, Robert, yes, definitely. We can get that to you. Um, and um, we'll, uh, we can send you the, whole, the PowerPoint and the slides. And we also have a calendar with these checklists on that you can have that you can put, keep in your office that would uh, and, and, and so the best way to do this, Robert, is to contact your rep who's in charge of your area, and uh, they can get you all this information. OK, next question by Bill Clark. Is there a specific type of lubricant that you would re recommend for the drive gear? Um, there again, it depends on the type of equipment that you have. and. Um, um, I would suggest you get a hold of your, your rep also, Bill, so, so so we can find specifically what you have. But but there's a lot of different varieties of gear uh, lubrications out there. Um, I, I I'm kind of a, a fan of a, of a gear uh, open gear lube, but that's made by Whitmore Products. That's a green uh, lubrication that is non-mineral oil based, so it has a nice. Uh, um, a uh, blend of uh, of uh, alloys in it and so forth. And uh, the neat thing about it is instead of having all that grease and mobile tack all over everything, it comes off in little balls. And you can sweep it up and throw it in the trash because it's environmentally safe. So um, there again, you can uh, if you contact one of our guy, uh, one of our customer service reps, we can we can go through anything that you want on specifics. Um, how do you go about doing an ultrasound inspection on the roller shafts? Edward Hilton. Um, yes, Edward. Um, basically, what you would uh, want to do is uh, um, we offer these type of services as, as kind of during our, our plan outages. But there's a number of different um, um, testing uh, people out there that do uh, non-destructive testing. Um, from ultrasound to uh, different phase arrays and so forth. So you probably have them coming in, checking welds and different things in other parts of your plant. Um, it would be probably a good idea to go uh, and, and talk with them and see if they offer that type of thing. And there again, if you call our, our your uh, customer service rep, we can get you uh, the information on some of the guys in your area of the country. Mike Cahill. How do you um, how do you determine proper creep specifications for the, for the dryers for your dryers? Again, it, it, there's no real uh, engineering um, 
spec that calls out what creep should be. A lot of it depends on the type of wear patterns that you have. Um, but if you're starting to see a lot of retainer block wear, stop block wear, um, as a result of, uh, of uh, thrust conditions, the, the more creep you have, the faster that wear will accelerate. So it's just kind of, in, in a lot of ways, it's a feel thing. Can the trunnions be rehardened after the eighth inch of wear of induction uh, or um, um, the case hardening of the of the of the rollers? Typically, this is from Dan Johnson. Typically, Dan, I I, I don't recommend it to be honest with you because you you have varying hardness. Now, what I've seen done happen in the past is where you can actually come in. You'd have to send it into a shop, have it the have the uh, that layer of hardness or whatever's remaining removed, uh, and then you can either uh, case harden it again, or I've seen uh, different uh, people uh, shrink sleeves onto that. But it's a situation where, for most the most part, this type of design was obsoleted for a reason, and and uh, it's always better to go with through hardened rollers on your equipment. But there again, that would be something that you might want to talk to our customer service rep to get the, the specifics on, on, on what you have on your equipment. Um, Matthew Jacobs, uh, please email us sides. We'll do that, Matthew. Um, what determines, what, uh, Mike Cahill, what determines whether we use a fixed or floating uh, riding ring? It really depends, Mike. It really depends on the the um, the design of your equipment and the temperatures. Now, now um, most floating riding rings are used because of thermal expansion. If you have a high amount of thermal expansion on the tire and rollers, you're basically going to need some kind of floating riding ring. If you have uh, very cool dryers, for, for example, a, a couple hundred degrees or less, um, it's not really necessary to have a floating riding ring. Um, and some manufacturers have actually welded tires right directly to the shell. But there again, it just depends on the, the design of your equipment. So I, w I would talk with, uh, again, with our customer service rep, and we can find out a little bit more about you. Um, Patrick uh, Gordon, uh, uh, the PowerPoint we send out will not include audio, but this particular recording uh, that we're going to give you a link to will have the full audio on it. So if that answers your question, um, and then you and you and then you asked uh, Patrick, uh, how often do you give these classes, and can this class be given on demand if scheduled? And the answer to that is yes. We do uh, do site-specific training. In fact, I've done uh, a number of them over the last couple of years. Um, so that is something that if you are interested in, call your customer service rep, and we can work out a, a situation to, to get you one of these in-house. And then we also do, uh, periodically during the course of the year, we also do regional workshops where we do training for uh, kilns, dryers, and, and uh, operations as well. Okay, Timothy Borum. What is the typical fitness heart, uh, of the hardness on the trunnion roll surface? What hardness? Um, Rockwell. I, uh, Timothy, I've always worked with Brunel, so I, I can't come up with a Rockwell, but we can get you that information. Uh, but tip, typically it depends on whether if it's a through hardened roller, um, and um, or if it's a case hardened roller, the case hardened roller is only a very fractional amount, eighth inch, something like that. Uh, whereas through hardened will be um, will be anywhere from three to four inches thick with a varying hardness after that. Uh, okay. I'm not real sure how your pronunciation of your your name, but Moisey uh, Dion. Uh, what uh, what do uh, what is the high 
thrust button pressure is, is unusually high. Here again on the thrust roller, it really depends on the, on, on the, on the type of, of, uh, of equipment that you have designed. First indication of high thrust pressure is if you're starting to get wear on the surfaces of the thrust roller and the tire. If you start to see grooving of that, of, of that kind of nature, then you probably got too high of thrust roller pressure. Um, anyway, uh, Ash, Ashley Guy, can you, uh, can you use graphite on the rollers? Uh, actually, graphite on the, the, the trunnions or the rollers is our preferred method of lubricating tires and rollers. So yes, to answer your question, you can use graphite. You can use it in the form of a block, or you can have a powder applicator if, you're, uh, if you have our, our high RPMs. Uh, should we be greasing the trunnion? Uh, this is from, from Michael Miller. Should we be greasing the trunnion and the tire mesh? And if so, what kind of use do you, you suggest? Okay, I think I just asked, uh, answered that, Michael. We don't really recommend grease. I know some manufacturers have them out there, but um, what happens with grease or oil on the surface of the tire of roller or tires and rollers is that it's contaminated. It's easily contaminated, and you're going to mix grit, dirt, um, metal, or any anything with that oil, and it's going to form a lapping compound and, and accelerate the wear on the tires and rollers. Uh, we recommend using graphite blocks or graphite powder. In the, if the graphite powder uh, would be used on higher speed units so that it could be applied on a, on a, on a, a more frequent basis, uh, it, the problem with graphite blocks, if you have high speed units, it, they can glaze up and you won't get a good deposit of uh, lubricant on the, on the tires and rollers. But I, we would we would we would recommend avoiding grease or oil on on trunnions. Okay, this is from Joshua. One thing I have not seen in your presentation is the heavy thrust wear on the riding ring downstream. How to resolve this is a short term without replacing the riding ring. Okay. Um, Here again, Joshua. I think you know, on, on, in your particular situation, we may want for you to call in and talk to one of our, our customer reps and get you to talking to somebody uh, to, to find more of the specifics on on this particular thing. So, if you want to call in, uh, we'll we'll be glad to help you with that. Okay, this is from Bill Clark. When skewing a kiln, is the 15,000 amount a standard, or was that only used as an example? Uh, Bill, that that was used as an example. Uh, you know, it varies all over the place depending on the size of the unit, it's the speed, uh, the loads, and so forth. So uh, that that's a situation that was just an example. Okay, Travis Montoya. Uh, what kind of grease do you rec recommend for trunnion uh, roller bearings? For the bearings themselves, um, that, that that's going to be specific to what your equipment is. So, I would I would suggest you call in and, and uh, to the customer service rep, and we can talk specifically with with you uh, about what type of what type of equipment you have and the bearings and so forth. So, um, it's it's hard to say because there's so many varieties out there. Um, from Bill Clark. It would appear to me that the rollers are wider than the tire. Wouldn't that mean that we would always get some sort of wear pattern? Um, yes. To answer your question, Bill, yeah, you you would see um, some wear um, as a result of of uh, of the of the rollers being wider. That and that's that. There again, that's that's why uh, skewing the rollers. Or minimal amount of thrust on them is so important because the more you skew them, the greater the pressures, and you're go you're going to have more uh, uh, wear patterns. But but unfortunately, that's just the nature of these these pieces of equipment. There's no way to get around not having a little bit of wear on them. Okay, Tim Thomas. To control creep, you have to tighten the shoes. 
how tight is acceptable and can you get the shoes to tight uh, too tight to not allow the creep and possibly to sort the shell. This is not visible, so how can I determine this? Tim, probably uh, probably one of the things that you've really got to monitor on, on this is, is what's the temperature of the shell? How much expansion you get between when it's, uh, when it's not operating and when it's operating? For for example, if you if you have a temperature that is is uh, when it's operating is 150 degrees and and when you're putting the shims in it's 75 degrees. Like say for example, you only you're only going to have like a very small amount of temper temperature differential. So in that particular case, what I would do is I would shim um, the tire tight. And, and, and that way, um, if you're not having a lot of temperature in the shell, you have very little danger of distorting the shell as a result of, of, of expansion. So, so you kind of got to know that going into what your operating temperature is and what, what, what the temperature is and between uh, the, the time you're doing the shimming and the time it's operating. And if you're only... Uh, um, so forth. I mean, if you're if you're only got like 70, 80 degrees to 100 degrees difference, you're, it's not going to really affect it at all. And Tim, I, I got your. I, I'm looking at your uh, question here about the, the Rockwell hardness and so forth. And um, and we'll let. Let me get you to let me get to you on that one, okay? Thanks, Bud. Okay, Robert Porbeck, can I get a continuing education certificate for this webinar? And the answer to that for your PE license is yes. We give certificates for PE license to all of our attendees for webinars and uh, and our regional workshops. Kurt Dillon, your question is, is uh, a graphite block or powder graphite preferable? There again, it really would, uh, it really would depend on uh, what your speed of your unit is, uh, the, the difference on it. The, the thing that's nice about the powder graphite is you can set it up on a timed basis, so you can actually use it as, as, as a of, of a means to let the let the unit go uphill and downhill on thrust rollers and can and have a very defined um, controlled uh, way that you operate the unit. So there's some real positive things about the powdered graphite. Um, the blocks can be very functional and have been have, have been used for a long time and they're they're great. Um, in certain applications. So it really would depend on what you have. And there again, if you're really interested in talking more about that, if you want to get a hold of our customer service rep, we can uh, we can get you more information specific to you. Um, Bill, uh, yes, uh, to answer your question, will the question and answer session be included in the webinar? And yes, it will be included. Um, the, and Mike Cahill, uh, what is the best way to check trunnion skew? Okay, if you have a, a dryer with kilowatt bearings, probably the best way to do it is is through uh, alignment. But we also have a tool that we call a T track, and it's designed specifically for checking tire. Uh, Tire and trunnion skew, uh, and and uh, it's a great way of checking it. And there, if you would get a hold of our customer service rep, we can send you a flyer on what the T track is and how you know how how beneficial it is to use for trunnion screw. I've been I've been doing the uh, the alignments on dryers and kilns for years, and when I came to IKD, I found out about this T track. And I said, man, I've been beating my head for a lot of years doing it the way I was doing it, trying to measure everything 
and so it's a great piece of equipment. Okay, this is uh, this is the end of the questions. Um, I'm going to. Uh, um, I guess I guess this is the end of our first webinar. So we appreciate you guys calling in, and uh, um, and at this point in time, if there's any questions or you need to talk to us about anything, uh, please give our customer service reps a call, and uh, we'll be glad to answer your questions. And if you need to get a hold of me, uh, call into those people, and they will help you, and we can uh, answer any of the further questions you should have. And Please feel free to uh, email us with questions, and uh, and uh, we'll be sending out uh, uh, notifications of where the this PowerPoint and webinar is on our website. Again, thank you very much for attending today.